this evening. So a couple of weeks ago, we made it all the way through chapter 4 because the second half of chapter 4 was easy to just summarize in a sentence or two, saying that there were more that covered uh, the time between Cain and Abel and then the rest of the folks that lived during that time. Last week, we spent more time talking about Enoch and also the long lives of, of Methuselah and some of the others who lived during that time. We came right up to the point of discussing the fallen angels who lived during that time upon the earth. But we did not talk about them who lived during the days of Noah. And we stopped right before we would talk about the days of Noah. So that's where we're going to pick up tonight. Genesis chapter 5, verse 28 is where we will begin. Reverend Brooks, sir, would you please pray over the Bible study? Our loving Father, we appreciate this chance to get together to continue the study of Genesis. We appreciate your word and your love. This evening we ask you to bless this Bible study, bless, bless Pastor Watson as he teaches what you build upon his part. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 5, verse 28. And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begot a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begot Noah five hundred and ninety and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred and seventy and seven years, and he died. And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The days of Noah, Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. So what we see here is not just a natural reproduction of mankind, but a corruption of mankind. What we see here are the fallen angels who, with Lucifer, rebelled against God, attempting to corrupt the natural heritage of mankind through whom the seed of the woman would be brought into the world, as was promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God had told them, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the promise was given that a natural man would be born, the seed of the woman, to destroy the works of the devil, essentially, as it's told in 1 John in the New Testament. For this reason was the Son of God made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so the devil's plan was that if we can prevent a natural person from being born, then there will, no, uh, there will be no seed of the woman. There will not be this promised redeemer who can be born into the world to defeat me. The devil would have that plan. Okay, so how do we know? How do we know that this is what's going on? It says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now, the sons of God, it, it stated that they who took the wives of the daughters of men were the sons of God. That is, God produced them. They were not reproduced through human biology. They were not sons of men. They were not reproduced people. They were sons of God. That is a term that is used in the Old Testament in a couple places of angels who were produced of God. Not through any biological means, but by creation. Okay? It says in the book of Job a couple of times, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So it's used of both the holy and fallen angelic beings, because God created them. Not because they were reproduced of humanity, not because they were reproduced of themselves, but because God created them. Okay? In Job chapter 38, it says, When the morning stars sang, to get, sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, speaking of their witnessing of God laying the foundations of the world. Okay? The sons of God is a term that's used in the Old Testament for angelic beings, supernatural beings, whom God created 
rather than having been reproduced by men, by biology, by humanity. So that's why they're called sons of God. In the same sense, Adam is also called a son of God. In the Gospel of Luke, where it's giving the whole genealogy of Jesus, it says this one was the son of so-and-so, this one was the son of so-and-so, this one was the son of so-and-so, and it goes all the way back to Adam. And in Luke chapter 3, verse 38 says, Adam, which was the son of God. Why? Because Adam did not have parents who reproduced to bring him into the world, but God created him directly. He was produced by God, so he is the Son of God by direct creation. Okay? In the New Testament, Christians are also called sons or daughters of God, having been born again. The Gospel of John says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, right. nor of the will of man, but of God. Yes. Just as in John chapter 3, when Jesus and Nicodemus were having their discussion, and Jesus told him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you must be born again. It's not just enough that you were born of your mother, but you must be born again of the Spirit of God. You were reproduced into this world after fallen humanity. You must be born again. You must be produced of God. Spiritually. And be a son of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. God giving the promises. Remember he said in chapter 5. Therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things are become new. So if having come out from those old ways. Having come out from that old life. Being made new. We are his children for that work that he has done. To make us a new creature. Where he. He says, uh, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay? So we see that sons, daughters of God are those who are produced of God. As he said again in the Gospel of John, not born of the flesh, not of blood, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. Mm -hmm. So we are the sons and daughters of our own parents. They having reproduced us. Okay? But by our faith in Jesus Christ, we are begotten again of God. Yes, yes. So that it says here that they are the sons of God means that God directly produced them. Mm -hmm. The term sons of God here in this particular verse where it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men contrasts them in direct opposition to those women who were biologically reproduced. The term sons of God in the context of Genesis chapter 6 does not mean that they were holy. It just means that they were the direct creation of God. Because we see in other places of Scripture, this scenario, this exact uh, place of Scripture that we're reading, where, it, let me finish uh, this passage, it says that they... Uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took of them wives of all that they chose. Okay, coming down to verse 4, it says, There were giants also in the earth in those days. Mm -hmm. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and their children with them, and they became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Okay, so the term sons of God in this context, in opposition to the daughters of men, does not mean that they were holy angels. Because we see in the context that they were unholy. And we see other places of Scripture in the New Testament where this example is referred to to show that they were in rebellion against God when they did this. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, he says, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. What? What? He doesn't say the angels that came down and had babies with women. And spared not that old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, being in the flood of the, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Yes, he is. He's talking about those angels that were there upon the world that did have babies with women and were wiped out in the flood. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about there in 2 Peter chapter 2. God spared not the angels that sinned. 
They were in rebellion against God. Jude, verses 6 and 7. Remember, we talked about Jude last week when we were talking about Enoch. I like Jude. I like to think of him as, as being the one who really puts the truth of, of these myths that people had been carrying on for so long. He says, no, this is really what happened. Forget all of that stuff and the legends. This is Let's just stick to what really happened. We don't need to worry about all the legendary stuff when God has given us the truth. He says, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. So God had created them as angels. Whatever capacity they had to leave that supernatural existence, they exercised it. They left their first estate. They left their own habitation. The angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness unto the day of judgment, that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving them over to, uh, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So these verses indicate that the angels that came and reproduced, okay, they left their supernatural, they left their their exalted, we could say, estate to abase themselves in the flesh. They, they took wives of natural women and they reproduced giants, which were freakish in nature. Okay? They left their own nature that God had created them to inhabit, and God equates that with the unnatural sins of fornication, and moreover, of homosexuality by showing, look, it's going to be the same type of judgment that Sodom and Gomorrah received, that the angels received, that those who continue in rebellion against God will receive when the judgment of God comes upon the rest of the earth in the future. So the verses that Jude wrote indicate that they sinned against God in violating their nature violating the nature that God created them to abide by, even as the homosexuality that God judged in Sodom and Gomorrah was against the nature that God created people to abide by. Okay, So we see that, yes, these were angels, sons of God, because God produced them directly. They were not reproduced by any means. But they were not holy angels because they were in rebellion against God, which was indicated not only by what they did, but further proved by scriptures that were written about them later. Okay, So let's read this whole passage. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the children of men, and bare, uh, came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. And the same became mighty, and men of renown, which were of old, men of renown. So it says after that. So the giants were born before the flood, but it also happened again after the flood. And you can read about it here in Genesis before the flood. And you can read about it after the flood in Deuteronomy and Numbers and Joshua and Judges and First and Second Samuel. It happened again after the flood. That angels came to attempt to pollute the bloodline through which the Messiah would come. Yes, These were the giants who inhabited the land of Canaan, the promised land that the Israelites would come into. Remember in the book of Numbers when Moses sent the spies into the land to say, go see how wonderful it is. And they came back and they said, it's truly a land flowing with milk and honey. See, look, we brought back this bunch of grapes that's so big we have to carry it on a staff between our shoulders. Look how wonderful this land is. It's truly wonderful. But we saw the sons of Anak there. And we're but grasshoppers in their sight. We saw there the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Numbers 13.33. And we all know that Damis, uh, David so famously killed 
the giant Goliath. Wasn't that after the flood? Yes, and that's what it so says here in Genesis. Giants, giants before the flood. the flood, and giants after the flood. That's exactly what it says here. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also they were after that. Just killed off. No, we're getting to that because right here David killed Goliath, and then David also killed the rest of the giants. The last of them were killed by David and his men. Because when David went down to fight Goliath, remember what happened? It says that he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered why David took five stones out of the brook? It's not because he was uncertain that he was going to hit Goliath with that first stone, but because there were still four giants left. There were five, when, when Goliath stood out there and defied the armies of the living God and God, there were five giants left remaining in the world, okay? The Israelites, as they had been coming through and, and conquering Canaan land and, and God blessing them and, and destroying their enemies from before them, they had almost completed the job. There were five men of the giants left. David killed Goliath with one stone, but he had taken five stones from the brook. He chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd bag. And his sling in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. He wasn't uncertain that he would miss him or that he might not hit him with that first shot. He knew what God was going to do, but he was ready for the next ones. Mm -hmm. Because you come down in 2 Samuel chapter 21, and you see that the rest of the giants were killed by David and his men. 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 15 says, Moreover, the Philistines had war yet again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbanab, which was with his sons, uh, which was with the sons of the giant, the weight of his spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. He being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zuriah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. So there's one more giant down. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt no more go out with us to battle, but thou quench the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this, there was a battle with the, with the Philistines at Gob. And Sibachai, the Hushite, slew Saph, which was the son of the giant. There's another giant down. And there was a battle again in Gob with the Philistines. And Elhanah, the son of Gerajim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath where there was a man of great stature who had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he was also born of the giants, and he defied Israel. And Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. So there were the last four. When David took those five stones out of the brook, he knew what he had facing him right. after Goliath fell. But he knew, even when he took those five stones, God's got this one, God's got that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. David knew what God was going to do. Yeah. Continuing on in Genesis, chapter 6, verse 5. So we read in chapter 4 about those people that lived a long time, and, and we, we pondered what it would be like upon the earth, even in our day, if people who, who rise to power with wicked intentions were allowed to just continue to live out natural lives for 900 years. What about people like Stalin or, or, or Fidel Castro? Now, now, there were some who did not live out the natural extent of their lives. You know, Hitler killed himself. Um, others were killed by, by some other person. But Stalin and, and Fidel Castro and others, they lived for a long time, and they were terrible oppressors, yes, sir. not only in their own countries, but even aggressive against others. What would it be if people like that gained power and for hundreds of years were allowed to keep it? How terrible and violent would the earth be yes, at such a time? And we begin to wonder, would it really be that great to live that long in an earth so terrible? No. And it says in chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Think about that. The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every 
imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That means out of the whole lot of them, none of them had a good, pleasant, peaceful, Love. loving thought at all. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So it had not been wrong. It had not been sin that God needed to repent of. It was not wrong for God to create the earth. He said it was good. Yes, sir. It was not wrong. It was not sin for God to create man. He said it was very good. That's right. But repentance does not just mean the term, the very word repentance does not have that singular definition of, of regretting something wrong that you had done. But it also means simply regret of the results of something. And that's what God experienced. He saw the wickedness of mankind and he regretted that they had degraded themselves so far. He regretted the destruction that had come upon them by them acting in their own will as opposed to his. The violence, the hatred, the destruction, the prejudice, the immorality, the lewdness, the depravity. That's not what he made us for. That's right. That's right. That's not what he made Amen. us for so many thousands of years ago. Amen. That's not what he made us for today. Amen. Come on now. God did not make us fit for destruction. That's right. God did not make us to live a depraved life. You know, I look around sometimes. We go through neighborhoods to invite people to church. And, and sometimes you can go into a, a fancy neighborhood. And you're still going to find a house that's, that's run down. And a person living in it. Not because they can't keep it up, but just because they don't have the mindset that they're worth it. And sometimes you go into a neighborhood that is run down. And you'll still find those houses in that neighborhood that are kept up, not because they have the money to keep it up and make it fancy, otherwise they'd probably move out of there, but just because they have the dignity. Yes, they know what God created them to yes. be. Yes, amen, amen. God didn't make me to be a pig. Okay. God made me in his image. Yes. God made me to glorify him. And if he didn't give me all the money for a fancy house, I'm going to glorify him with what I have. If he didn't give me all of the things to be fancy in this world, I'll glorify him in who I am. I'll glorify him with my attitude if I've got nothing else. That's what God made us to be, a reflection of his love. Yes. And if I've got absolutely nothing else, I can love somebody else. Come on. I can love somebody. I can show them compassion. I can show them kindness. But the people in the world in that day had none of that. Hatred, violence, prejudice, immorality, depravity of mind. And it grieved God. In chapter 4, if you go through and read about the things that people said about themselves and about one another, you read about, yes, the murder of Cain and Abel, but later on you read about more murder. You read about uh, sexual depravity. You read about the glorification of violence. Just from chapter 4 of Genesis. And the time that passed from when Adam and Eve sinned against God to the flood was 1,656 years. And in that time, it says that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continually. That's it. That's all there was. It wasn't getting better. Because people can't make it better on their own. We can't make it better, but nobody trusted in God. Nobody called on God to say, God, do something to help us. Nobody said, is there anything that we can do besides trying to do it ourselves? And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it didn't just say, I'm oh, just going to, just going to start it out uh, over. I'm just going to keep them spinning on their own world, uh, on their own way to destruction. But it grieved him in his heart. He was sorry to see people in such a state. Yes, sir. That's right. But the Bible said in Psalm 103, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Merciful and gracious, slow to anger. Yes. Yes, 
and plenteous in mercy. Plenteous in mercy. Second Peter again. Second Peter, the same one who wrote about the surety of the judgment against those fallen angels and the others that will continue in their uh, footsteps of rebellion. Second Peter said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he wrote that regarding his coming again for us presently. But he had also used the example of the day of Noah. When God delivered the world through Noah, because it was through Noah who in his obedience built the ark to deliver anybody who would have gotten on that boat that God saved everyone in the world who was willing to obey. So, God saved everyone in the world who was willing to obey. And there were only eight of them. Everyone in the world had a chance to get on that boat. And only eight of them did. God didn't just say, I'm sorry, I did it. Get them all out of here. He said, I'm sorry that they're so messed up because of their own hearts turned against me, but I'm going to give them a chance to be saved from this destruction yes, that's sir. coming, yes, just sir. like we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. Just like the whole world has in Jesus Christ today. It's grieving to God's heart to see people destroyed, yes. their lives torn apart, their families torn apart, the destruction of nations and, and homes yes. and cities. But God says, all you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ and he'll deliver you from it. Amen. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. But judgment is certain. Judgment is certain. But just as certain is judgment, so also is God's mercy. Yes, hallelujah. And he will not withhold mercy from those who trust in him. That's why we read that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. That's right. That's right. And we'll get into more of his story next week. But it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah, that one man, that conjunction, the word but, B-U-T, sets him apart from everybody else on the planet. Yes, sir. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The first time that word grace is used in the Bible is used right here for Noah, who for his obedience will be the one who provides deliverance by God for all, for all who would trust in God and call upon him and act on that trust. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you have given us a way by faith to be delivered from the judgment of our own sins. Thank you, God, that you've shown us the examples in your word both of your judgment, but also so much more of your mercy. We pray, God, that you use us to be also examples of your mercy. Lord, that we live according to the dignity that you've created us to uphold, that even if we can't live in so much finery and fanciness, let us live in your love. That even if we can't give the greatest of earth to others that we desire to impress, desire to, to show our, our affection toward. Let us give the best that you have as we share of your love and of salvation through Jesus Christ with them. Help us, God, to be who you intend us to be. Yes, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this evening. God bless you. Thank you.